The Lagos State Governor Babajide Songwolu sets up a five-man panel to investigate the cause of the Ikoyi building collapse and make recommendations. Kidnapped staff of the University of Abuja and their relatives regain freedom. And Ethiopia's government asks citizens to prepare to defend themselves as Tigrayan rebels advance on the capital Addis Ababa. With that, we say good morning and thanks for joining us on PLUS TV Africa this Thursday morning. It is The Breakfast and I am Usaogi Ogbonwa. And I am Mercy Abokpo. It's good to have you join us. Very interesting Thursday morning. Our tri top trending stories this morning a move even outside Nigeria. Um, we'll start here in Lagos where, of course, the Lagos state government uh, did name a couple of the survivors of the Ikoyi building collapse yesterday. They're still... Of course, a rescue effort still going on. Uh, as at, uh, The last time that I uh, reported in it yesterday was about 21, 23 people uh, confirmed um, dead, unfortunately. Uh, but nine people, of course, were named as survivors, and there's still search uh, going on for more and more survivors. And, of course, you, you, I've been saying this, how important time is, you know, in, in this regard. Every second, every minute, every hour that passes, uh, the chances of finding a survivor uh, continues to reduce, and we hope. Because I've seen, I've seen pictures. I saw a young lady's uh, picture who was, that was put out on uh, on social media by her, her friend, and I think her young uh, elder sister or so, uh, saying that she was one of those who um, worked for the company and was on you know on site on the on Monday when the building collapsed. So um, there's still you know a couple of people, family members still gathered around, hoping that there would be some good news and. Um, the current challenge right now is, uh, you know, we need to hasten up, we need speed, we need to, whatever it is that we're doing, we need to just act fast because uh, the more we keep waiting, the more, um, you know, at time we're just, and at the pace we're working at, yeah. we might just lose everyone. <coughs> because, uh, like you earlier mentioned, and like we have been saying right here, that time is of the essence and every time, every minute actually counts. Now, I'm listening to the governor yesterday making some statement when he revisited again, he did mention the fact that uh, some measures have been put out, uh, especially where they have to put out oxygen, uh, you know, and then maybe water so that those, you know, because at, looking at the situation now, <clears throat> the building that actually collapsed, you know, that people will be gasping, uh, gasping for breath and all of that. So I think it's okay, but the point right here, right now, is we need to double the effort. We need to do more uh, so that we can actually rescue because the more time is going, the chances of having people survive is very slim. It's just, I mean, every single time that I see these clips or I see those pictures, I am, I am stunned um, as to, you know, the magnitude of this. This, this is... So, so over time, and sadly, well, it's a good thing, I, I think, you know, that Nigeria doesn't get to experience a lot of natural disasters. So these aren't things that we normally experience, you know, every year, every six months, you know, there's a landslide or an earthquake or tsunami, anything. We don't get to experience, you but know, things we get like to, that. Okay, yeah, but sure. we eventually, I mean, why I'm saying that is because as a country, we're, we're not that country that is... 100% prepared for disasters, we're prepared for rescue, prepared for some of these type of incidents where you can tell that um, the agencies that have been set up for um, disaster management, um, you know, have you know, lots of experience with dealing with these things and so they know what to do the next time it happens. We don't get to experience this a lot. And so um, I, I sadly do not think that these people who are on ground there would give 100% of what is, you know, when they say world best practice with regards rescue, I don't think that they will, sadly. No, it, it, it um, can't happen. That's because um, when you talk about leveraging on other people's experience, uh, truth, like you rightly <laughs> mentioned, uh, we don't get to experience all of this disaster. But the point is with all of the disaster that we have experienced, like I mentioned earlier, and Anna would say, this is not the very first time we're experiencing a collapse, uh, a building collapse in Lagos State or in Nigeria. So um, what lessons have we even learned? That's the point. What lessons have we learned? So Why haven't we been very proactive? Why haven't we thought about the fact that, yes, it happened the first time, it happened the second time, uh, third time, and it's going to happen. I'm sorry, it's really going to happen again. But why are we not learning? Why are we not saying, okay, what do we need to do to curtail the number of persons that die? I mean, at the time where the synagogue church, I mean, the, what's it called again, um, that particular residence collapsed, 
160 something died. Yes. What are we doing? Why haven't we learned from that past experience? I don't know. So we can be I, better. So we keep waiting and acting as if we live in a different space. So what, once These again, things would always happen. Once again, um, anyway, let's let listen to what the governor said yesterday. We have a quick track to play. Um, the governor who was on ground yesterday made some statements and we'll, we'll share that with you. So for us to get to the, to the real um, um, issue of what had happened, I've set up a high-powered... Com um, um, commission of Inquiry. Um, it's it's um, a strong professional um, investigative panel that are consisting of everybody from outside of government. It's a five member with one secretary that is also external and they've been given you know, a clear terms of reference. Right Later today I will be meeting with some of them and will identify where they're going to work from and we're going to give them a 30 day assignment for them to wrap up and tell us indeed you know, professionally, what had gone wrong here, and who are the culprits, and what do we need to do? I have town planner Tayo Ainde, who will chair. He's the current president of the Nigerian Institute of Town Planners of Nigeria. I have Dr. Akintilo Idris Adeleke. He's one of the foremost structural engineers in the country. He's the best in class as a structural engineer. I have architect Inka Ubundairo, is a partner with one of the leading architectural firms in the country. They have done several, several, several developments like this. I have builder Godfrey O. Godfrey. He's also been um, 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 identified as one of the foremost builders in the country and was recommended by the Nigerian Institute of Builders. And I have Mrs. Bumi Ibrahim. Um, she's a lawyer and she's also um, a property player who understands and knows from a legal perspective what should be the remits, you know, of um, government and also a developer of, of this magnitude. Um, to be the secretary of, 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 of this panel, it's a gentleman called Mr. Ekundayo or Nojobi, who is also a lawyer and works with a, with a private law firm. Oh, um, the Lagos State Governor, you know, speaking about the five-man panel that he's setting up to investigate. Um, and uh, find out exactly what went wrong on Monday in Ikoi. Um, I, I really hope that we get the best out of this. You know, sadly, we've lost more than 20 people. Um, I'm hoping, you know, that they continue to do what, what is necessary and they give the absolute best that they can. Resources, finances, time, whatever it is that is necessary to ensure that whoever is, is still buried under that rubble, you know, will be found. It, it just really, really breaks my heart. Well, um, I uh, hope that they, they that they, they and also, you know, the, the Lagos state government needs to know that the people believe that this is just going to be another thing. They're big boys. That's the word. Uh, the, this award you find on the street. They're big boys. They're going to cover it, cover it up. Uh, they're going to just find a way. I, no, I hope well, that's not going to be the narrative. So th they need to know that that's what the people think. People are thinking that, yeah. you know, it's just one of those things. They're big boys. Everything I, will just I think I'll, down. I'll, I think I'll hold nothing on. Nothing would happen. I think I'll hold on with regards um, punishment. Um, if there needs to be punishment. I'll hold on to, you know, to those thoughts till we're done rescuing people. So, so let's, let's deal with the most important, and that is saving lives. After, you know, saving lives and as many lives as possible, then we can now get into a conversation on um, who failed here and whose lapses led to this collapse and this disaster. And also, um, maybe, maybe look into the timing with regards um, the rescue um, operation starting. We can look into those. There's so many details to this that I hope that we do not ignore as a country because that that's who we are as, as, as a country we eventually just uh, okay mm -hmm. two weeks later everybody's moved on exactly and so, those so people actually details, think that yeah people actually think that those extra details will not well, be out and nothing will happen as usual and that's what people think we'll get so to. i'm thinking this is the point where government needs to you know do otherwise you know when someone is expecting you to behave in a particular way and then you shock them and surprise them so well, we'll, we'll get there and you know, it's not also trying to push the government into punishing people that don't necessarily need to be punished just to show <laughs> that they're working you know so i think i think we'll get there let's focus on on saving lives for now um in other top trending stories this morning in rwanda the of course president abiy ahmed has uh, declared a state of emergency um seeing that of course the tigray people's liberation front the tigray rebels as they're popularly called are fast advancing towards the capital. This is not very different from what happened in Afghanistan. 
um, where, of course, diplomats and, you know, and, um, you know, government officials eventually had to flee the country. That is currently what is being recorded or reported from um, Ethiopia. It says diplomats, government officials and, you know, whoever else, um, else can um, are currently fleeing the country as the government has declared a state of emergency and asked the people of Ethiopia to pick up arms and defend their country from the Tigray rebels. And I'll quickly mention that Abiy Ahmed is a, a Nobel Peace you know, a, a Prize winner. Um, he eventually became president, and people have criticized him for being the same thing that he campaigned against when he was um, you know, awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. He be became you know, pretty much similar to the same terror that he you know, campaigned or he fought against. Those are some of the things that people have mentioned. And if you've been following the, the fighting in, in um, Ethiopia, if you've been following the stories and following you know, the moves that Abiy Ahmed has made in the last one year in his bid to rid the country of the Tigray rebels, then you might you know, get the sense that, yes, people might be right with those claims. Um, there has been you know, um, 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 food blockade. There has been bombardment of, of the Tigray um, area. There have been so much of um, you know, um, um, abuse you know, by the Ethiopian government in its bid you know, to fight against the Tigray's, uh, Tigray rebels. Um, I don't know how this would turn out, but it doesn't look good for him at this point. You know, because I remember you know, a while ago when, when I used to see these stories, I used to say to myself, Are you sh is, is he sure he's doing the right thing? Does he really know exactly what he's doing in his fight against the Tigray rebels? Um, but it doesn't seem to have turned out very good because currently, if they are approaching the capital, it means that Ethiopia is, 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 going, is very likely to fall if nothing is done um, as quickly as possible. Mm. Um, uh, it's it just uh, a reminder saying, you know, the people should pick up arms and defend themselves. Sounds like something we've heard before in Nigeria, you know, where, the, you know, some governors will say, uh, at this point in time, you need to defend yourself. It just also goes to show that um, the issue of uh, security, it's a global issue. But at this point in time, you begin to ask yourself uh, the international bodies. I mean, for the, those who begin to preach uh, global peace and prosperity, what is going on? Why is there no intervention at this point in time? What is happening? Well, the, the, um, the, 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 um, I think that this, this shouldn't be breaking news, but you know, the, the West doesn't really care. Um, <laughs> if there's no particular interest that they have, they, they don't really care. You can kill yourselves in your country. That's your personal problem. I mean, they, that's the truth. They don't really care. So, so, so they, they are not going to be helping you out, you know, for any reason. And I know that he also is not in the best books, you know, for, for the West. Um, I'm talking about Abiy Ahmed now. I will also mention that he was a member of the Tigray forces before he became president. So he was part of that movement. He supported that movement, you know, as an anti-government. So, so, so it feels like having a taste of your own medicine. Yes. So he supported it. <laughs> Eventually, when he became president, then he now started trying to whittle down their forces and their power. And that's when all this war started. And, you know, the people, of course, of Ethiopia have become the, the biggest victims of all of this. Um, I don't know how many more days or how many more weeks, you know, well, where this is going, but it doesn't look good for Abiy Ahmed, neither does it look good for Ethiopia as a country. Um, and they are not, I, I, I don't think I would describe the Tigray rebels as a, they're not a terrorist group per se. They're not necessarily, you know, a Boko Haram or an Iswap or any of all of that. Um, so I'm not expecting that the U.S. will say, okay, let's jump in here and fight, you know, help you fight your battles. Um, Ethiopia is, is, is a scary place to live in currently. And, you know, I'm, I'm, once again, I started, you know, by saying that this is very similar to what happened to Afghanistan. You know, at some point, uh, the capital fell, uh, the capital Kabul fell, and, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, the end. Um, everybody knows where the country currently is. So good luck to Abiy Ahmed. We'll be here to report um, as much of the, uh, the developing story concerning Ethiopia as time passes. Finally, here in Nigeria, or back here in Nigeria, um, of course, uh, it made the news yesterday, and a lot of people got to speak about it, how Nigeria currently owes China more than $3 billion as of um, a third of last quarter of 2020. We were owing China $3 billion. And this, of course, has created a little bit of worry across the country because a lot of Nigerians are asking, what did we do with China's $3 billion? Um, what did we achieve with it? And why are we owing China $3 billion? And also, how um, are we going to pay back uh, this $3 billion to China? It's not the, you know, the largest amount of money that is being owed you know, from one country to the other. But seeing how Nigeria is currently struggling with its GDP and struggling to raise money every year to finance its budget, struggling to raise money every year to, you know, to, for, because of a budget deficit and to pay back loans that it's taken in the past, this is scary. And also because of the narrative 
that once you owe China, you, you don't necessarily just owe China and pay them back. You know, there might be some interest that the Chinese government has with every country that it is giving loans to. And we're not sure what the, exactly the, the truth is. Are. Nigeria is not just owing China. I mean, if you look at the list of who Nigeria is owing, which is actually in public space, you find the IDA $11.62 billion. You also have the diaspora bond, $300 uh, million. You have, I mean, the list is almost endless. Uh, you also have the International Monetary Fund, $3.50 billion. So Nigeria is not owing, just owing China. It calls for a lot of concern. It might also interest you to know that the federal government, uh, you know, at the time, but between uh, January and March, spent a total of 1.8 trillion naira on debt servicing. And that's, it calls for a lot of concern. Now, with the issue of borrowing, there's nothing wrong in borrowing. I mean, we also see even, you know, developed countries borrow as well. At the time, you found out that the U.S. was also owing China and what have you. Yeah. But the point is, how do you invest? Because if you invest, if you borrow this money uh, and invest properly, wisely, would be the word. It would trickle down. What you will begin to see would be uh, growth and development you begin to see it. So what do we borrow this money for? Yes, we know that at some point government will say we're borrowing for infrastructure, but let's look at it. Let's look at it. It's not about what we say. It's not about what we say. It's what about what we can see. Just like you would say the country is out of recession. How are the people feeling it? How, because at the yeah. end of the day, it has to translate. It ha how much money do we have in our pockets? Uh, what, you know, how, what is the standard of living? That's how you begin to measure. So it doesn't necessarily really matter when we begin to mount all of these things in the books. We're saying, yo, we're voting for critical in infrastructure. How much of this can we see? The point is, over time, it feels like we borrow to pay salaries. And that's not really good. It's like you borrowing to have a wedding. Oh, I know a lot of Nigerians do that. But it's not really wise. You mm. borrow to invest for productive purposes. So it doesn't really make sense. And the fact that you have a lot of intellectuals in the economic team of the president, I mean, a lot of... Nigerians are very smart people. What is wrong? How come we begin to see some of these actions? Why do we constantly borrow? Look at the current, uh, you know, the capital expenditure over time. Yeah. And look at the recurrent expenditure over time. You find out that we pay so much attention, you know, to, um, you know, cost of running governance. And we pay less attention. Now, any economy that wants to grow, we we'll rather pay attention, you know, to the cost of developing. And so when you begin to look at the recurrent cap uh, expenditure, it tells you where the heart of that country is. No, you, you just go check wow. all of that out. So it's really unfortunate that we're constantly spending, and we're still borrowing. As of yesterday, the Nigerian government saying we're borrowing more. So where are we even going? At, at some point, I saw this story, and then I was just making <laughs> fun of it that we're all owing money, including you. I'm owing. I'm not owing pay. anybody. <laughs> I didn't borrow money from anybody. All right. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, Off the Press kicks off, and we'll be sharing with you the major stories making headlines across Nigeria uh, this morning. We'll be back.